everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our panel. Um, it's entitled Historic Resources as Green Infrastructure, Advancing Miami Beach's Sustainable Development. Uh, I'd really like to thank first and foremost our panel for taking time out of a busy schedule. I'm really excited. They're all truly experts um, in their different fields. Um, I would also like to thank all the board and staff at MDPL, especially Daniel Seraldo, the executive director, and all the organizers for Art Deco Weekend, and it's in its 41st year, so really amazing to be a part of that. Uh, I'm going to introduce a few remarks and then turn over the presentation to the panel. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end, so we hope to you know, make it a very lively conversation, so please save your questions for them. Um, so looking at Miami Beach, it is comprised of historic resources. Up to 30% of the building stock is currently within historic districts, and it will increase with the North Beach additions that, we, that were just mentioned. This has significant implications for property tax revenues, tourism, adaptive reuse construction, and local employment, but also provides a new way of viewing sustainable development for the future. Infrastructure is defined as the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society. Today, I hope to convince you that the existing buildings, much of them within the city's historic districts, should be viewed as part of this green infrastructure network. MDPL was originally organized by the visionary Barbara Bayer Kapitman and friends in 1976. And even upon its founding, Kapitman understood the inherent links between architectural, cultural, social, and most importantly to this discussion, environmental integrity, as recognized in MDPL's mission statement. There has always been a historical link between natural conservation policy and the development of historic preservation legislation. The National Historic Preservation Act brought a national framework and attention to preservation advocacy efforts happening around the country. And in 2017, MDPL launched the Center for Resiliency and Sustainability to target education, advocacy, and research between the integration of resiliency and sustainability with historic resources. As you know, sea level rise has been a main topic of conversation, but we really can't talk about long-term resiliency without considering integrated sustainability policy. This topographic intersect map at a two feet elevation demonstrates that over 28% of historic resources will face challenges by the year 2050, according to recent scientific research. And if we zoom into the nationally and locally recognized historic districts of what is commonly referred to as the Art Deco Historic District, we can see that over 20% of historic resources will be impacted at two feet of sea level rise. One of the topics that I find consistently absent from planning initiatives and capital improvement projects is the fact that historic preservation can help achieve sustainable practices. A goal of the Center for Resiliency and Sustainability is to create awareness of historic resources as contributing to the triple bottom line, known as the three Ps, combining profit and people with objectives that benefit the planet. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on two positive uh, benefits of historic preservation to Miami, Miami Beach's sustainability goals. Um, the first is the historic district's contribution to life cycle assessments, also known as LCA, and also the concept of smart growth principles. So in the LCA framework, we look at the entire lifespan of a building to quantify the outcomes of adaptive reuse versus new construction. Instead of negating the embodied, um, embodied energy of existing buildings that happens through demolition, adaptive reuse attempts to close the circle, reflecting a net positive to sustainability initiatives. These are not new ideas, and it builds on research dating back to the 1970s, which argue that the greenest buildings are the ones already built. This has been quantified in reports from the Preservation Green Lab of energy savings totaling 4 to 46%. This 2011 report by the National Trust for Historic Preservation produced one of the most in-depth studies to date, demonstrating that it would take 10 to 80 years um, for a new building to overcome the negative impacts related to new construction. On the whole, most historic buildings use less operational energy too. They were designed before technological advances made living in South Florida year-round possible, and buildings had to take advantage of sun, wind, and light. Most Art Deco buildings were built in the second column prior to 1945. 
In conclusion to the importance of viewing sustainability through the lens of life cycle assessment, we know that buildings account for up to 40% of worldwide energy consumption. We know that adaptive reuse of existing buildings reduces total energy output, and this should be considered as Miami Beach continues to evolve their policies for sustainable development. I just wanted to touch on one more subject of smart growth principles. The very definition of sustainable development is the ability to meet our own needs without prejudicing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Some of these indicators can always be better improved, however, many can be applied to existing historic districts. And if we read down the list, we can see that creating a range of housing opportunities we can say also applies to historic districts. They are definitely very walkable neighborhoods. They encourage community and stakeholder collaboration. It's all something that's all top of mind with preservationists. Um, it fosters distinctive, attractive places with a sense of place. Makes development decisions predictable, fair, and cost effective. Mixes land uses. Provides a variety of transportation choices. Strengthens and directs development towards existing communities and also takes advantage of compact built design. As a resident of Miami Beach, I am proud that the city continues to innovate and experiment with sustainability and resiliency policies. As an example, finding new sources for the city's resiliency fund through lead status in Chapter 133. I would like to see future conversations for incentivizing adaptive reuse or sustainable retrofits of existing and historic resources more prominent in sustainability capital improvement projects and integrated within green infrastructure conversations. Finally, Miami Beach has always been a resilient city. From the 1926 hurricane, the city recreated its image into an internationally recognized Art Deco destination. A downturn in the 1970s led to a rebranding of Miami Beach as an artist destination, started by Cristo's Surrounded Islands in 1983, and which now led to Art Basel Miami Beach and to the defiance of Kaepernick and the founding of MDPL, where the buildings themselves became resilient through historic preservation protections. I believe Miami Beach will continue to be forward-thinking and rebrand itself as one of the most sustainable cities in the world. Historic preservation must be an integral component of that change to balance existing resources with new development. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our expert panel. Uh, first, we have Richard Heisenbottle. Um, He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Miami, go Canes, and um, one of the most respected architects in South Florida. Uh, he has more than 35 years of experience in architecture, planning, and interior design. Um, in 1987, he formed RJ Heisenbaum Architects, and um, he was recently awarded the um, Miami chapter of the American Institute's Architects Silver Medal and was elected to the AIA College of Fellows in 2005. Um, he's well known for historic restoration, including the Gusman Center for the Performing Arts, one of the first atmospheric theaters in the country, the Colony Theater, uh, the Freedom Tower, the Sky Museum, and also the uh, Miami Edison Middle School, which won the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation National Preservation Award. Um, he's also the recipient of the Outstanding Preservation Project Awards from the Florida Association of the American Institute of Architects and has won numerous, numerous awards from the Miami chapter of the AIA and the Florida Trust um, for Historic Preservation. And today his lecture will be titled Historic Resources as Sustainable Development. Um, next we'll hear from Christine Rupp, who is the uh, Executive Director of Dade Heritage Trust and she'll really talk about her expertise in building consensus among communities and how nonprofits, what their role is in all of this. Uh, third, we'll hear from Thomas Mooney, AICP, and he is currently the planning director for the city of Miami Beach, and he's going to discuss the challenges of planning, design, and historic preservation, and how those all meet in the public sector. Um, he has a wealth of experience for almost 30 years in the public sector, and is very involved in lending his expertise to charitable organizations, including his certification as a historic district tour guide at MTPL. So, shameless um, <laughs> 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 plug. Yes, yes. Yes. So, uh, yes. thank you to Richard and you.
Okay, thank you everybody for coming out on such a sunny and wonderful Miami Beach uh, afternoon and, and sitting in a dark room listening to me speak. Uh, and my other good friends here speak. Um, but what we're thinking about it is certainly something that, that I truly believe uh, we should all be extremely concerned about. Uh, the whole notion of sustainability it is, it is, as you're going to see as I try to go forward and walk you through this presentation, is, is a matter of social responsibility for, uh, for all of us. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, let me, let me advance this discussion with a perspective uh, from, of, of a historic preservation architect. Um, some of you may know of a, a friendly little product of ours, Carl Fisher Clubhouse Restoration, which is going on um, in the process right now for the city of Miami Beach. Uh, and, and so we got in that advertisement for, for that, uh, Daniel. Um, as Laura was saying, and I'm going to amplify, sustainable development is an environmental responsibility. I will tell you that it is an economic responsibility, and that it is a social, cultural responsibility as well. It affects the viability of our cities, the livability of our cities. Uh, and, and, and the equitable nature of our cities. And where does historic preservation fall into all of that? Well, I would tell you that historic preservation falls right in the middle of all of these responsibilities. It makes our cities more viable, it makes our cities more livable, and it makes our cities more equitable to all of us. In recent years, sustainability has come to mean more than simply being environmentally responsible. We have seen that older buildings and blocks are a key component to creating successful cities and successful neighborhoods. Historic fabric creates economic vitality, social equitability, and strong and resilient neighborhoods. Uh, it's called the Greenest Buildings. Uh, and, and it, for the first time, uh, quantifies the environmental value of building reuse. Now, I'm, uh, I know we're all here as preservationists, and, and as a, uh, I wouldn't do anything else, Daniel, having won the Barbara Capital been on our board, <laughs> uh, uh, I wouldn't speak any other way. But, um, but it is more than just our historic building stock that we should be thinking about. It is the reuse of all existing buildings in, in the city of Miami Beach and, and, and the city of Miami too. And so the National Trust in dealing with this issue and in recognizing it as a national, an important national subject created this preservation green lab that was, that was mentioned earlier by Laura. Uh, and until Preservation Green Lab did this sort of study, there really was very little known about climate change reduction and what climate change reduction might be offered by the reuse and retrofitting of existing buildings rather than demolishing and replacing them with new construction. So this was really a groundbreaking study by Green Lab that concluded that the reuse almost always offers environmental savings over demolition and new construction. And it really provided the most comprehensive analysis to date potential environmental impacts reductions associated with building reuse. Utilizing the life cycle cost analysis that was also mentioned earlier as, as the primary methodology, it's a very accepted methodology for this sort of thing, it compares the relative environmental impacts of building reuse and renovation versus a construction, uh, versus new construction over the course of a 75 year lifespan. You can understand why that is the logical period, the logical time frame. So it examines the indicators within four environmental impact categories, including climate change, human health, ecosystem quality, and resource depletion. It tests six different building typologies, including single-family homes, multi-family building, commercial offices, urban village mixed-use buildings, elementary schools, and warehouse conversions. So it, it looked at buildings literally across the entire board of, of building types. And its key finding, key findings, because we're through a few of them here, 
is that building reuse almost always yields fewer environmental impacts than new construction when compared to buildings of similar size and functionality. But it goes much further than that. The range of environmental savings from building reuse varies widely based on the building type, based on location, and the assumed level of energy efficiency. You can imagine these are very different from Seattle to New York to Chicago to Miami. But they studied four different areas of the country and, and, and put all of that information together. And savings from reuse are somewhere between 4 and 46 percent over new construction when comparing buildings of the same energy performance level. But it gets better than that. The study finds that it takes between 10 and 80 years for a new building that is 30% more efficient on average than the existing building stock to overcome through efficient operations the negative climate change impacts related to the construction process. In other words, it could take between 10 and 80 years, even though you're building a really energy efficient new building, before you can kind of recoup the loss. That doesn't do us very much good today when we start thinking about sea level rise and the impact of, of, of uh, carbon footprint. Talking about carbon footprint for a minute. The absolute carbon related impact reductions can be substantial when they're scaled across the building stock of a city. For example, if the city of Portland were to retrofit and reuse the single family homes and commercial office buildings that it is otherwise likely to demolish over the next 10 years, the potential impact reduction would be approximately 231 metric tons of CO2. That's a lot of carbon. So the reuse of existing buildings, even with an average level of energy performance, offers immediate climate change impact reductions compared to even more efficient new construction. Let's think of the magnitude of this nationwide. Each year, approximately one billion, that's a B, square feet of buildings are demolished and replaced with new construction. The Brookings Institute projects some 82 billion square feet of space will be demolished and replaced between 200 to the year 2005 and 2030. Roughly one quarter of today's existing building stock. I might suggest to you that that's almost socially irresponsible. Now, most climate change scientists agree that action in the immediate time frame is critical to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. We can't wait 30 years. Reuse of existing buildings can offer an important means of avoiding unnecessary carbon outlays, outlays, outlays and help communities achieve their carbon reduction goals in the very near term. Now I want to speak for a moment about, about a second study. It's called Untapped Potential. And this was just published, published in October 2017. And it outlines strategies for revitalization and reuse. And what I think is particularly exciting about this, it's not written by just a preservation community talking to itself. We're good at that. But it's written by the National Trust and the Urban Land Institute. Now, the Urban Land Institute, for, for anyone that doesn't know it, you know, has over 40,000 members worldwide. Uh, and, and, and really represents not only architects and engineers and preservationists, but developers a, a, as well. And anyone in the real, generally, in the real estate industry. And this report recognizes that Neighborhood commercial cars with mixed use and, and, and uses and housing types. Thriving local businesses, both new and old. These are the places 
that make a city district, provide hidden density, cultivate diversity, and they are nearly impossible to encourage without the inclusion of older and smaller buildings. Yet in many places, older buildings remain underutilized assets, sitting fully or partially vacant due to financial or regulatory barriers. Without, with the knowledge that older buildings contribute measurably to the health and performance of neighborhoods, the question is, what can be done to bring the benefits of reuse to more places? Ever walk down Flagler Street? I know I'm in Miami Beach here today. But ever walk down Flagler Street and think about how many empty buildings there are on either side of it. The untapped potential report summarizes the technical, market, financial, and regulatory barriers to building reuse and offers best practices for policymakers, developers, and community advocates interested in building reuse as a tool to create healthy, equitable, and resilient communities. So the key takeaway here, in my view, is that there's a, there's a consistent set of barriers hindering building reuse. That's a shame. While market conditions, regulations, and development patterns are unique in every city, the study revealed a common set of challenges that block the reuse of older buildings. The most frequently cited barriers include outdated or inflexible zoning or building codes, the presence of one-size-fits-all parking requirements, a lack of adequate financing opportunities, for new and small developers. There's a need to map the inventory of our existing built assets, to know exactly what they are, so that we can deal with them. If they're not met, you can't. In many places, fragmented, incomplete, and difficult to access information about stock of older buildings really limits the impact of reuse efforts. Now, comprehensive programs are, are very powerful tools. And one that is suggested here, and we can probably talk about this and engage this in the discussion, Tom, is an adaptive reuse ordinance such as the one that was adopted by the city of Los Angeles in 1999. And it really has demonstrated the power of packaging regulatory relief, flexibility, and technical assistance to unlock the potential of vacant urban space. In other words, developing an actual ordinance that would make it easier to adaptively reuse historic and other older buildings. Recognizing the transformative power of this comprehensive approach, the National Trust and the ULI actually provided us with a guideline. It's a model adaptive reuse ordinance that can be customized and adapted to any city. In my view, I think we not only have the environmental responsibilities to deal with, the, I think we also have the economic responsibilities to deal with but we also have the social and cultural responsibilities to deal with. And today, I am pleased to say that I think that at least there is momentum. There is momentum on the ground by folks like NDPL, but like everyone in this room with an interest in the, the topic of sustainability, to address these issues and to lobby our local governments, to adopt ordinances that make it easier and not more difficult to adaptively reuse buildings because it is good for each and every one of us. It is good for the growth of our cities and all the things that make our wonderful city of Miami Beach great. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.
Don't worry. Next, did you guys have my slide? My slides? What do I do? Get on Thank you, um, and thank you so much, Laura. I'm really pleased to be here to talk a little bit about preservation and day heritage trust. I'm Christine Ruff, I'm the Executive Director of DHD. I've been the Director for a couple years, and I'm probably different than anyone else on this panel. I have no formal education in preservation. Um, I'm not a city planner, but I do have a sense of the importance of advocacy for preservation and education. I used to be the Director at the Coral Gables Museum, and I was hired by DHD specifically to start developing public programs, both in advocacy efforts and for education, to uh, make people aware of Miami's historic assets. If nobody knows about them, and let's face it, preservation is a challenge here, because most of us are from somewhere else, so if we don't bring that buy-in to the significance of history in Miami's rapidly evolving that, and the, um, the extreme property values all make preservation a challenge. And I would guess that everyone in this room knows the value of historic buildings. Is there anyone here that doesn't? This is generally the, this is generally what happens if, with a presentation like this is that we're preaching to the choir. So I want to bring a bit of a different perspective. Since I've been in Dade Heritage Trust for two years now, I've come to understand the politics of Miami-Dade County and our community. And let's just say it's fun. It's interesting. And um, it's never boring. Uh, this morning, I was a little bit late because I actually led a bike tour. We present bike tours every month to different urban areas in Miami to let people know about the historic assets that are there, to get them engaged in preservation, to become civic activists, which is so important, the, the sense of civic engagement. And this morning, we rode from Dade Heritage Trust. This is our little headquarters building, if you're not familiar with it. It's the original office of Dr. James Jackson. It was built in 1905, originally rested on Flagler Street in downtown Miami. Dr. Jackson sold this office in 1916. The person that bought it was going to tear it down. So really in one of Miami's first acts of preservation, Jackson said, no way, I'm taking my building and I'm moving it. So he actually utilized some of uh, Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast Railroad technology to take this lovely little building, push it down Flagler Street, and he was going to float it over here to Miami Beach where he owned some land and make a little weekend getaway. Well, while this building was sitting at the base of Flagler Street, on, and when it was purchased by the state of Florida, or when, when it was deemed over to the state of Florida, it was the intention of the state to create a museum and educational center. The, this little house is just like a little chalet dream. It's a little over 900 square feet. And it's where Marjorie Stoneman Douglas drew her inspiration for writing about nature. So the intent was to use it as an environmental education center. What a lovely idea, right? The woman that helped us save the Everglades. Well, the neighbors on Stewart Avenue opposed that. They didn't want traffic, and they didn't want exposure to their lovely neighborhood. So they formed an agreement with the state of Florida to prohibit that from happening. So we have a, a situation now where, where they say, well, let's move the house because that way we can save it. But if you move it from its environs, you've kind of lost the, the historic integrity of, and, and why that house was important. It's also, which you would never believe if you wrote out there, a national historic landmark. Uh, so here you have political pressure from the residents uh, you have the state that's not quite sure what to do, and you have, it's also an historic structure that would be governed by, this, by the city of Miami under the Historic Preservation Board. So now it's just sitting there, and I'm happy to say that rich daycare trusts in the state are getting together to have a conversation about what to do. 
So the three pictures that I have on the screen, the Coconut Grove Playhouse on the left, the Burdines Macy's building in the center, and the Olympia Theater, all mired in um, a variety of opinions and a variety of politics. And I will tell you, the best thing that preservationists can do, whether you're a trained preservationist or you love historic buildings, is figure out a strategy and speak willingly to all of the parties who are involved or may be involved in a particular project. If you do not build consensus, we know what happens. Things stretch out. Things get totally mixed up. And, and, and meanwhile, that, that historic asset sits there and deteriorates. Don Worth, here we go. Mike Murray Stadium. How long have we been working on the stadium, Don? 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. And good news, the city of... This, yeah, who's counting? It's only a decade. The city of Miami voted last week to actually place the Miami Marine Stadium on, on the National Historic Register. So that's a, a very good thing. Um, and that has been that has been working to develop a strategy to get concerned parties involved. You have to come out of this making everybody look like a winner. Everybody was the hero. And that's especially true in the political process. So, Rich, when you talk about all of those wonderful initiatives and incentives, the first place we need to start is with our politicians. Because if, unless you have the political will, you're dead in the water. Land in Miami is too valuable. So, I will tell you, I read that report with great interest because one of the cities they targeted was Detroit. I'm fortunate to have family in Detroit. And I was up there between Christmas and New Year. And I'm telling you, downtown Detroit is undergoing a renaissance like you would not believe. Every historic building in that central corridor is being rehabbed or restored. Detroit, I would encourage you to go there. Uh, last week on the CBS Morning Show, they were talking about hot tourism spots. Guess what? They didn't name Miami Beach, but they did name Detroit, Michigan. Who would have thunk it? not dismissing Miami, it's fabulous. And I rode my bike here today. Uh, I, I, rode, I did the bike tour and then I rode over the Venetian Causeway. And you know, I think if you're in the preservation world here, you go through this love-hate relationship, right, with Miami. And you know, when you ride that causeway, you go, come on, what other cities like this, right? It's the best. So if we can only get our politicians to buy in to the importance of saving these historic structures, then we've got, we've got something major. And if we can do that through ordinance building, then we really have something. So we have a lot of work to do as presentations in this community. Coconut Grove Playhouse, Rich um, is involved in this, but um, how long has the Playhouse been sitting like this? Over 10 years. Um, and there was a plan that was approved by the City of Miami Historic Preservation Board to go forward with the, the demolition of the existing back of how the, the true playhouse save and restore the facade. That decision was appealed by two residents of Coconut Grove and the city agreed with the, with the, uh, with the appellants. So now essentially we're back to, back to square one with what to do with the playhouse. There, there are other plans being presented, but this, the preservation board in the city of Miami even has to figure out what to do next. Um, parties involved in that were Save the Coconut Grove Playhouse, Coconut Grove Playhouse Foundation, City of Miami, State of Florida, who owns it, Florida International University, and uh, am I missing any other entities there? <laughs> That's enough. Um, I'll go I'll hop to the Olympia Theater on the right, um, otherwise known as the Gusman. Have you all been inside that theater? Anyone who has not? Okay, you need to go visit this incredible theater in downtown Miami on Flagler Street. The Olympia has had scaffolding around it for over 10 years. The facade is falling off. And the scaffolding is there not to repair the building, but the scaffolding is there because the scaffolding has a roof on it and it's pr to protect people from walk who are walking down the sidewalk from debris falling on their heads because of course risk management from the city, this is the city of Miami owned building by the way. Coconut Grove Playhouse is owned by the state of Florida. Uh, Olympia is owned by the city. So about, I guess it was three months 
ago. The related group, who we're all familiar with, if you live here in Miami, a, a large development company, came to the city of Miami with something called an unsolicited proposal. And they said, look, we would like to, um, they used the word demolish, but they, they, we found out they really weren't talking about the theater. There's a 10-story 10, 10 tower that sits back a little bit from the theater, but um, it's, real, it's where the, most of that debris is falling from. So then their idea was to go vertical on the site and integrate affordable housing on Flagler Street. Now you should know that there's all, in those 10 stories, that's, that was already deemed affordable housing. That's a long, that, that's a four hour presentation in and of itself. So um, the related group, if you really drill down to what they were doing, and, and if people could have like maybe worked with them a little bit, worked with the city, and come up with a common solution, it, it, it may have been a solution. But this is, this is what happens in the preservation world too. People get passionate. They, they become alarmist without knowing all of the facts. So that's another really cautionary tale. If you're going to get involved in advocacy, at least go visit the site and at least understand the politics and the processes that are there. So the, we met with the related group. Daycare Trust sat down with them. It does no good to do this with the development community in this town. So we met with them. We did not join this alarmist train. They're going to demolish the Olympia Theater. I took a lot of heat for that. But um, the, the best thing is to stay calm, stay cool, and go, how, again, how can we work this out so everybody looks like a winner? So the Olympia, the Olympia Theater pulled its unsolicited, unsolicited proposal, but that triggered from the District 2 commissioner, and I'm telling you, this all goes, it, it all gets back to politics, the creation of an RFP process, request for proposals, to adequately run, or restore, and creatively, adaptively reuse the retail that re resides in the front of that building, and then the residential or office space on top. I was um, I was <coughs> asked to chair that task force. Oh boy! <laughs> so now I we have a ten member task force, and we're on a fact finding mission to figure out what is the highest and best use for the Olympia Theater. And I will tell you, it's going to be a struggle. If you look at that theater, and you look at its existing footprint, the city of Miami, at this time, has no intention of putting one cent into their building. They want a private develop development team to come in, fix it, operate it, and be responsible for it. And it's hard to make the case, it's hard to make a business case for someone to come in and spend lots of money, millions of dollars to rehab that and, and then be able to, um, to, make a, to make some money on top of that. So that's going to be interesting. We have four, month, four more months till we give our final report to Commissioner Russell and then we'll see where the city goes with that. But they are charged, we are charged with fact finding to develop an RFP. So it's exhausting folks. <laughs> Um, and then the newest jewel on Flagler Street, and, and Rich is right, we all need to take a walk on Flagler Street. And, and we have some incentives and some initiatives working right now to save those buildings. But um, it was announced a couple weeks ago that the Macy's building, if I, and I, if I don't call it Bird Eyes in front of some people, I think they're gonna like attack me. But the Ma Bird Eyes Macy's building on Flagler Street um, is something that when it was just announced, we took action very quickly. I called the city of Miami, I reached out to the owner, and we had a board meeting, and we said, what direction do we want to take? So I've been able to broker a meeting between the person that's representing the building owner, the city of Miami Historic Preservation Office, the DDA, and Dave Heritage Trust. And this is where we need to get. If you can get in on that ground game early on, get everybody sitting down at the same table, and having some intelligent discourse instead of alarmist conversation, this is the road forward for preservation, I believe. So um, I'm anxious to hear Tom, because you are a city employee, and uh, I'm anxious to hear governmental's perspective of preservation. Of course, we all know, you know, Miami Beach is the, the icon when it comes to preservation. Not so much in the city of Miami. 
Um, how many people are in the preservation staff and on the and staff of Miami Beach or in your department? Our department is 25, and out of the 25, three. <laughs> three full-time preservationists in the city of Miami Beach. Um, a lot of others do preservation. And a lot of others. In the city of Miami, there's one, there, there are two full-time and one part-time person for a city the size of Miami. So we are, Dave here, when I say we, I mean Dave here to trust, we, we assist them every possible way we can um, to make their jobs easier. And I feed them information that they don't even get from their own, um, their own people. So help. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
require the preservation of significant buildings. But this took a couple of markers. The city's first historic preservation ordinance was in 1984, which was about eight years, um, I'm sorry, five years after the National Register District was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. But between 1984 and 1988, the uh, Historic Preservation Board had no binding authority to prevent demolition. It was a six month waiting period, and then somebody could go tear down a building. And then I remember my first, my very first Art Deco weekend that I attended, I was still an undergrad in 1988, uh, they were passing out flyers to save the senator. And um, a lot of you may remember the senator, it was on, was on 13th and uh, Collins, it's finally being replaced. They said at the time they were going to demolish the great new building and instead we had a service parking lot for almost 30 years. Um, but after the demolition of that building, the uh, commission was finally forced to give the Historic Preservation Board binding authority uh, to not allow for demolition and to require preservation. And when I started in 1993, that binding authority was there. It was actually enhanced a year after I started to protect post-war modern buildings because at the time that I started, between 1988 and 1994, the real protection only covered buildings that were built before 1948. It wasn't until 1994 that the preservation ordinance was, was significantly strengthened to protect minor buildings. In the 2000s, we saw a new uh, challenge, which is demolition by neglect. And that's something that we're still facing right now. Um, in the 2000s, a lot of these buildings really began to show their age. And what some developers were doing, unfortunately, is deciding to vacate the building, sit on them, and just let Mother Nature, Mother Nature take their course. And ultimately, in some instances, unfortunately, the building official was required to issue under the Florida Building Code an emergency demolition order. There were code fixes to try to address that, but I would be lying if I said it, it wasn't still a slightly ongoing problem. Not as bad as it was, not as acute, but it's still ongoing. From about 2010 onward, and currently, and this is probably our biggest challenge to date, and will absolutely be gone ongoing, is climate change and sea level rise. Um, and it's very, very challenging for a number of reasons. One, a lot of these buildings were built um, before there were FEMA regulations for flood elevation. Ironically, a lot of the buildings were built up fairly high, but a lot of them also contain basement space. A lot of them are commercial buildings that are inside sidewalk level. And on the western fringes of the historic districts, which are the lowest levels of the city, a lot of them were built lower from sidewalk grade. And as you may be aware, I'm sure all of you are, that Miami Beach, because it was an area that was mostly mangroves and was actually expanded through fill, uh, it wasn't expanded at the same height that the original limited part of the island along Ocean Drive was, the dune was. That's actually the highest part of the city. Um, if you look at a city topographically, it actually goes from high on uh, along Ocean Drive and Dune to low as you move westward toward West Avenue. And so some of the challenges that we've been looking at is how do we uh, come up with regulations that are going to ensure the long-term viability of these existing structures, particularly the ones that are in the lowest lying areas. Miami Beach has a, a mix of building typologies, and this is something that I talk about to audiences that are interested in historic preservation as well as just new development and generally how we're trying to address the importance of building typologies in an era of climate change. Because um, it's a dynamic that applies not just to historic districts. It becomes critical in historic districts because you cannot easily take down a building and replace it with a new one like you can outside of a historic district. So inside historic districts, it becomes even more important in terms of how those buildings will be adaptively reused and how technology uh, will be able to further their existence. In terms of a, a very short history, Miami Beach has always had, except for a couple of decades, a very, very uh, pedestrian-oriented building technology, particularly for residential buildings. And a lot of that has to do with a very successful street grid um, that goes with uh, the original cladding of Miami Beach. <coughs> and it was planted in a standard grid with all the buildings coming right up to the sidewalk. Um, and we were very lucky that our city was planted pre-Federal uh, Highway Act of 1950 where the uh, motor car basically took over planning after that point. We were planted at a time where most people were 
are still walking and still using transit. And these are some examples of, of, of our building typology. This is from 1930 to 1940, but all the years preceding this were very similar as well. During the 1960s and 70s, unfortunately, um, with automobiles taking front and center, our building typology in Miami Beach changed drastically. And as you can see by these examples right here, the first floor basically disappeared. Um, became a sea of asphalt, became storage for automobiles, and people were expected to enter the building from the middle of the site after driving into a garage in their car. Uh, very little was done to provide for direct pedestrian access to buildings. Um, and it was all about building buildings on stills over parking. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of examples of these. They are scattered throughout both historic districts and non-historic districts. When they end up being condominium buildings, these become very difficult to replace because ultimately you'd have to buy out of your unit owner. During the 1980s, 1990s, there was a different typology that began to introduce. That one was one of trying to combine the need providing um, required parking, which is still a good requirement, and still is in a lot of districts, with uh, also providing adequate pedestrian connection. In Miami Beach, it's very difficult to put required parking underground, for better or for worse. Um, there was actually an ordinance that was proposed um, late last year where we had recommended that there, no be, that there be no basic parking, but a lot of the developers um, were not in favor of that because they wanted that option. And clearly, from an urbanistic standpoint, from an aesthetic standpoint, an architecture standpoint, whenever you can bury the parking and have nothing but building above, it clearly presents a far superior project from an aesthetic standpoint. However, long term, the viability of these underground structures, as we've seen in older buildings, will be called into question, particularly as the seas rise and as tidal flooding gets worse. But in some of these examples, this shows how you can combine the screening of the parking with uh, a more pronounced type of pedestrian access, a more centralized form of pedestrian access that begins to at least minimize the impact of the vehicle. As we move forward, it's become very clear that um, for, clearly for residential projects, new buildings are being built higher. Miami Beach now has a free board ordinance which requires that all new residential construction be built at least one foot above base flood elevation. Base flood elevation is set by FEMA. We expect FEMA to issue new regulations either <clears throat> late 2018 or 2019 that could potentially raise base flood elevation. And Miami Beach's free board ordinance allows you to measure your building height from a base flood elevation of plus one up to a plus five. And so what we're seeing going forward are residential structures that are going to be uh, much higher than the ones that um, have, were, are currently existing and, and were built in years past. There's a number of different ways that you can address that, and I've got some examples here. One is a raised yard, another is planting, um, stairs, an unenclosed porch, or a roof porch. And all these examples um, assume that you're going to have parking at the first level. But one of the things that we've been discussing planning department over the last year is how that uh, understory area or that first level that's not going to consist of habitable units can be utilized in other ways. Um, could it be repurposed if it's existing parking or could it be better used for something else like communal areas or um, areas for the residents of the building to use that are not air conditioned. We believe that this will ultimately become a new building typology as we forward because it's still going to be very important for new buildings to properly address the street to coexist with their older historic neighbors that are lower to the ground and have a building typology that was always meant to be lower to the ground. Some of these examples include this is a um, these are terrace entrances to buildings um, along West Avenue where you've got step ups up to the actual living area and then behind it is the parking, or uh, above it will be the parking. And then as it pertains to commercial, um, that also presents a number of challenges that the city has been facing. Uh, virtually all of the commercial districts, not just the ones in local historic districts, but outside of historic districts, 
have been built at either the sidewalk elevation or maybe just above. And if new construction was to go in and build substantially higher, they're putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage as well as creating architectural challenges, particularly when their neighbors are already at grade level. If any of you recall what the Publix on the Bay and Fresh Market and Sunset Harbor looked like before the streets were raised, they were real anomalies. Um, they were both supermarkets, so they didn't care about having their customers walk up ramps and stairs. They wanted to be higher because they wanted to make sure that in the event of a catastrophic weather event, they were going to be open and be able to service people. Um, however, it did create an anomaly with all the other properties in that area. Lo and behold, when you fast forward 10 years later, now the streets have been raised, now it's only two steps to get up to each one, but all their neighbors, you have to step down. So uh, in order to address that, one of the things that we've been looking at are commercial transition zones. And these are zones that would allow for new construction to be built at a level where the first floor will still be consistent with the existing sidewalk elevation, but the interior of the buildings will be constructed in such a way that in the event streets and sidewalks are raised in the future, the actual interior floors can also be raised and there will still be enough volumetric space. Um, these are some examples from New York City where they try to put the first level of the retail space at or above base flood elevation. And again, it's, it's clunky at best because you end up with very, very long ramping systems and stairwell systems that are required right at the front of the property. And for a retailer, particularly, that becomes very, very challenging. This is what um, we had come up with in Miami Beach um, as part of the height ordinance. And these were some case studies that we used. The case study to the left, which is a commercial building with the ground floor at existing grade, shows you how much volumetric space that you would have. Um, and then what it would take to uh, raise the floor and how much more volumetric space you see. As you can see on the left, if you were to raise the floor of a typical um, commercial building, you'd only have 10 foot floor to floor left, which is not very much. On the right in the purple, you would end up with significantly more interior floor to floor space if the um, building was raised to the extent that is shown in this particular case study. And that's all I have in terms of um, slides. And then I 